Good morning. Good morning. Man, Merry Christmas. Wow. You guys are excited. So am I. <clears throat> Merry Christmas. Thank you, thank you. What a uh, great day to gather together and to celebrate um, as a church family our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, if you're a guest with us this morning or uh, maybe you're exploring the faith, uh, I, am, I am so excited that you um, are here this morning. My prayer is that you feel Welcome in this place. My prayer is that you are receptive to the gospel. Um, my prayer is that the Lord speaks to all of us this morning. Um, this Christmas Eve is the last Sunday, Jaden mentioned it, of uh, Advent. It's our last um, Advent series. And uh, during Advent, we focus on the first coming of the Messiah, um, the birth of Jesus, and so uh, there's different attribute, attributes of God that we look at, and um, <clears throat> you may have come from a more traditional church where they have uh, lit a candle after each service, and so I'm sorry we don't have candles to light um, after today's service. We were scared that uh, the building would catch on fire, and we didn't want to do that. Um, but no, that's... Uh, anyways, uh, if, 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 if you are familiar with uh, the candles that are lit, we, um, they, they symbolize the, the coming of the Messiah in four different, four different ways, four different elements, um, and usually after the fourth candle and final service, a fifth candle is lit to symbolize the coming, the birth of Jesus. He's finally here. He is finally here. And so we started out the first Sunday of Advent dwelling on the hope we have while we await the coming of the Lord. And so the angel Gabriel gave a hope-filled message to the mother of Jesus as he announced how Jesus would be wonderful, right? And so this Jesus that came into the world, he's the Savior and the King of the world. And it's, uh, it's that hope that we have. That's the only hope that we can have. <clears throat> and then the next week, we focused on the peace that Jesus provides. He's our peace offering. He came to be our Prince of Peace. He can take away all of our peace. All of, I mean, he can take away all of our anxiety, all of our worries, all of our fears. We just have to cast it onto him. That's what we're told to do. That's why he came. And then, last week, we saw that, um, <clears throat> that Jesus he came and gave us joy, right? The joy to the world. I love that song that Jaden sang. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Joy to the world. <clears throat> joy, as we focused on, is a state of being and is a gift given by our Lord to those who follow him. And so we saw how wise men from the east, wise pagan men from the east, non-Jewish people from the east, their eyes were open as they followed the star, if you remember, and they rejoiced, grown men rejoiced at a two-year-old standing there. They bowed down before him and gave him, gave him gifts. Today, we're focusing on Love. Love during this Christmas season, this Advent season, as we await the coming of our Messiah. We will see how the one who came as a baby, born of a virgin, he came as Savior and King of the world, is himself love. And so if we've, as we've done the past month, we'll spend some time looking at what the world says love is, and compare that to what scripture says love is. The definition of love in the world is an intense feeling of deep affection. It's a feeling, the world says. 
Often it's conditional. And people, they can fall in and out of love. That's what the world says. Love, in Scripture, is mentioned roughly 600 times throughout the Bible. It's pretty important. It's been mentioned the past three weeks that each of the words focused on the past uh, three Sundays have been exclusive gifts given to the believer. Love is the greatest gift of all these gifts. It's the greatest gift that you can receive. We're going to focus our attention on a very, very famous passage of Scripture today. One that you probably have memorized. One that uh, you grew up studying as a kid. You probably learned it, uh, had it memorized um, during vacation Bible school, or maybe you might uh, have done Bible skills, drills, and thrills, and, and try to be the first one to flip to it. John 3.16. And if you don't have it memorized, I encourage you to memorize it, dwell on it this week. Not only just memorize it with your head, but live it out. Live it out. Place it in your heart. And so, as we get there, I encourage you, if you have a Bible, please open to me, open with me to John chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 16. And before you do, I encourage you to pray with me. Father, I thank you so much for sending your Son, your one and only Son, to die in our place because you loved us so much. Father, I, I pray that I would not get in the way of today's message. Father, please just hide me behind your cross. Father, please reveal yourself. Father, I pray that our hearts and our minds will be receptive to whatever you have to say to each and individual here in this room today. Father, you... You are the reason why we are here. You are the reason why we celebrate Christmas. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for meeting all of our needs. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because... Their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. I've titled today's message as The gift only God can give. The gift only God can give. Most, like I mentioned, are very, very, very familiar with this famous verse, John 3.16. I was um, on a mission trip one time in, uh, in Africa, and I noticed all of these um, big, huge trucks, these big, huge uh, like semi trucks, and they would be hauling off um, either workers to go to the field, or they would be they would be carrying um, produce. And on these trucks, every single one of these trucks had either John three sixteen on it, not the whole verse, but just those words John three sixteen painted on it, or they would have uh, another verse. And so I asked the missionary that we were working with, why do they do that? Why do they have these verses um, on these trucks? 
And he said, well, it's because the gospel has been preached to these places, but it's been um, more like the, uh, the prosperity gospel. So if you just only put this verse on, uh, on your truck, then you're going to have prosperity. Or you're going to uh, be able to gain, uh, gain something out of it. And so my hope today is that's not what I'm trying to do. Some of us in the room... We may tune this verse out because we've heard it so many times over and over and over. My prayer is that it speaks to you individually. Don't leave this room. Like I said, week after week, we, we, we do all these traditional things. We sing all these traditional songs. We, we, we even come to a, a Christmas Eve service. Sunday after Sunday even. Don't just let it go through one ear and out the other. Dwell on it this week. This message of love. That's my encouragement. That's my prayer for you this week. Before this famous verse, Jesus is having a conversation with a Pharisee. Someone who is totally against him. Who comes to him at at night. And he points out, He says, Jesus, you're a a good a good teacher. You're a good teacher. Because nobody can do signs like that you've been doing unless God was with him. And if we're familiar with this story, he tells Nicodemus the Pharisee that you must be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of God. Each and every one of us must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. This leaves Nicodemus to ask more questions to Jesus. How can I be born again? What do you mean, Jesus? I can't enter into my mom's womb again? What? That's that's ridiculous. I thought you were a good teacher. (laughs) Jesus tells him, that he must believe in the one who descends from heaven and will be lifted up, implying his death that he would endure on the cross. Then he tells him, Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. His one and only son, born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is the message of Christmas. This is a Christmas message that Jesus is telling to Nicodemus. We're going to be keying in on this one verse this morning as we see the gift of Only God can give the best Christmas present ever. We first see how this gift of love was given by love himself. It was given by love himself. What do I mean? We must know who the giver is of the gift in order to be able to receive it with pure joy. 1 John 4, 7 through 8, it says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Listen to this, because God is love. God is love. Love is from God, and God himself is love. Now, man is able to love. You and I are able to love. But we cannot say that we ourselves are love. Nobody can walk around and even if you're the, think of the most loving and caring person ever. That person cannot walk around and say, I am love. (laughs) You just can't. You'd be a heretic if you said it. Our love will fail. Your love will fail. 
It will. But God's love is unconditional. You may have been told, I love you by someone. And then they turn around and fail you or hurt you, talk bad behind your back, maybe talk bad to your face. Wait, I thought you said that you loved me. That's a result of the broken world that we live in. Human love will never be perfect. Will never be perfect. Even think of a marriage relationship. You will have times where it's difficult to love your spouse. It's going to be difficult to love your spouse. Even for for children in the room that are listening. Sometimes there's going to be challenging times to love your parents. Because your parents are going to fail you. And you're going to fail your parents. It's because of the broken world that we live in. We fail each other constantly. We're all human. Even I, as a pastor of this church... I will fail you. I'm sorry. But I I try to love you. I try. Stephen tries to love you. Jaden tries to love you. We try our best. We care for you. But we're going to fail you. I have good news to share and remind you of this morning. God, he will never fail you. He will never fail you. He will never forsake you. He is always pursuing after you. No matter how many times you fail, no matter the most stupid, stupidest, don't even think that's a word, the most ridiculous thing that you've done, God's love will never fail. He loves you. His whole being is love. That's what it says. God is love. Now some, they distort this and make God out to be some softy. (laughs) He's not. They blame God for anything bad that happens. They say, "If, if God is love, then he wouldn't allow evil to happen. Have you heard that? Maybe that's come out of your mouth. You may have been in such a low time of your life. That's the only person you can blame is God himself. How can you love me, God? You allowed my my grandpa to die. How can you love me, God? You allowed my spouse to die. How can you love me? Why does evil happen in the world? We're asking the wrong questions. Or they make they make the love of God to be like, well, if God loves me, he would give me a a new car. Or if God loves me, he would he would bless me so much he wouldn't let me be in debt. I caution us this morning in doing that. That's that's not. Yes, he does want the best for you and I. And sometimes what's best for you and I does not include having a new car or being a millionaire. If my kid asks me for a new car, I'm not going to give you a new car. You can't even drive it. (laughs) Or if if my kid, some of you know, if my my two-year-old kid asks me for even $20. He's, he's two years old. Even if he asked me for $20. No. I'm sorry, Lincoln. I'm not going to give you $20. You don't know how to spend it. That's how, that's how we are with God sometimes. That's how, we, that's how our attitudes are with God. I caution us being that way. If we ask why... Why? Then we begin to place ourselves as God. 
we begin to place ourselves on the throne. If you remember my message from last week, it was all about dethroning ourselves. It's what we must do today and the rest of our lives. Dethrone yourself. He even, get this, he even makes the evil in this world all for his glory. God is love and his love is perfect. The the gift of love we see in John 3.16, it was a sacrifice. It was a sacrifice. The gift of love was sacrificial. God the Father sent his one and only son, his one and only son, it says, who, who was born of a virgin, who grew up as a man, who lived a sinless and perfect life and died on a cross and borrowed a grave for the sins of the world. This is the message of Christmas. In order to celebrate the birth of the Savior of the world, we must also celebrate the sacrifice on the cross as well. To have a clear understanding of John 3.16, we must look back at the very beginning, John or Genesis 3.15. This is the promise that God made. He said, he's talking to the serpent. If we remember the story, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and, your, and, and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you, sh- you shall bruise his heel. Crush the enemy. Some translations say, crush the head of the serpent. This was the plan all along. In the beginning, immediately after Adam and Eve fell into temptation by the serpent, God speaks and tells the serpent that he would send one who would crush the head of the serpent due to the separation that sin has caused. God loves you and I so much that he had a plan all along. He had a plan all along. Jesus was born to die. He knew this and he chose to endure the the suffering of the cross. He was obedient to God the Father because of the love that he has for you and I. He made it possible for us to restore and pursue a relationship with him. John 15, 13, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says, he, he, he tells his friends. He says, greater love has no one than this. That someone laid down his life for his friends. He knew that he was about to endure the cross. He was about to go to the cross and lay his life down for you and I and for his friends. This sacrificial gift was given because he loves His friends, he loves you and I. You're a friend of Jesus. Jesus was born in order to sacrifice it all and this sacrifice we see is the best gift we can receive. The best gift we can receive. It's what Jaden talked about. Is it really? Do you believe that? Does everybody in the room believe that? This, the, the, look, listen, The gift of love is how we are saved. It says it in that passage that I just read. In order that the world might be saved through him. Verse 17. God did not send his son in order to tell us how bad we are and condemn us. He came to rescue us. He came to restore us. He came to give you life. He came to give you life. If he came to tell us how bad we were, we would just be—he would just be telling us that we're dead and there's no hope. Jesus came to give us hope. He came to give us eternal peace. He came to give us joy. He came to show us how to love. When we believe in the one who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and died and rose again, then we will be saved simple 
The gospel is very simple. It's the only way. To receive this gift, you must admit that there's no other way. There is no other way. You must lay all your gifts aside. Lay all your gifts aside like the wise men did. Lay them down at the, at the foot of the cross. They're not worthy. Think of the best Christmas present you've ever received. Uh, <clears throat> I got to tell a story really quick. A Christmas present, my family knows what I'm talking about. A Christmas present that, um, that I asked for multiple years and I finally got. This, this analogy isn't really worth comparing to but um, the, the gift of salvation, but uh, in the, the young person's mind, it might relate with you. So I asked for this, this gift over and over and over. And finally, I can specifically remember uh, being woken up by my older brother. And he said, he said, hey, go downstairs. I knew immediately what I got. I was like, no way. You're, really? He's like, yeah, go downstairs. Okay. I bolted it downstairs. I was the very first person awake. I saw this red motor scooter. It had, it had a horn on it, and it had blinkers, and it had a little uh, storage compartment, and man, that thing could fly for about 20 minutes until <laughs> the battery went dead. I was so pumped. But listen, hear me. This gift is incomparable to the gift that's offered by the Lord. The gift of eternal life. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you this morning, if you've never received the gift of eternal life, you can do so this morning. It, it doesn't matter if you're the youngest person in the room today, or if you're the oldest person in the room today, or maybe you have, you have walked in these doors for the very first time, or if you've walked in these doors for the hundred and second time. Jesus loves you and he wants to give you the gift of eternal life that only he can give you. Uh, think of this. On Christmas Eve, you can celebrate your spiritual birthday. Think of that. You can have your spiritual birthday the day before Jesus has his birthday. That would be cool. Man. Lastly, I'm almost done, I promise. The gift of love is how we show people where the gift came from. Look at verse 21 one more time. But whoever does what is true, whoever does, be doers of the word, not just hearers. That's you and I this morning. Whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God, clearly seen. Not, don't walk around and where people kind of question, I, I thought that guy went to church. But man, he's not very loving. Don't live like, a, like you're a, a muddy pond. Live like you're a clear glass of water. Make, make it clearly seen. Clearly seen. It's what we're commanded to do. We are to be, I, I loved hearing this analogy. I heard this analogy one time and man, it just stuck with me. We're to be like the moon. Think of the moon. I'm talking about the, the big circle in the sky that we see sometimes at night. Right? But think of the moon. Maybe you need to close your eyes and really think. Some may have heard this illustration before, and if you have, it's good to be reminded of it. The moon, it has no light in of itself. It's a rock that's, that has a ton of dust on it. I've never been. 
That's just what I've heard. I'm fairly confident that we've actually gone to the moon. But the, the light, get this, the light that we see from the moon isn't from the moon. It's reflecting the sun's light. It's reflecting the sun's light. In the same way, we have no ability to shine light to others. We have no ability. We must rely on the sun to give us light. This Christmas season, for those who are believers, we are to reflect light to this broken and chaotic world. That's our job. That's how we show others who God is. Reflect His light. Reflect His light. Walk around and be like the moon. The greatest commandment, it'll be on the screen, that, that's given by God is found in Mark 12, 30 through 31. Jesus says, He quotes Deuteronomy, and, and, and He says, And you... You and I shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love people. There's no other commandment greater than these. Love God and love people. The way that we do this is by talking about him. Go and tell others about him. Gossip the gospel. Gossip about the gospel. Jesus gives believers a homework assignment. I'm going to remind you of this homework assignment today. While we are here, we must love God and love people. And to do that, Jesus commissions us in Matthew 28. It says, go, go. Don't stay here. Walk around. Go, therefore, and make. Make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go and tell people about Jesus. Go and make disciples for Jesus. And go and teach those people the commandments of Christ. Not your own commands. Jesus' commands. And trust that Jesus is with you to the very end of the age. He's with you and I right now during this Christmas season. You may not have anything physical to give people this Christmas season, but you can share with them the message of love. That's the best gift of all. So today, we focused on a Christmas message by viewing John 3.16. It's a very famous passage. And so as we anticipate the love that Christ provides us, we must, must examine the cross and celebrate the grave. Jesus came to die. He didn't stay dead, but rose again. That's how much he loves you. He loves you that much that he's not going to leave us here either. He promises that he's going to come again. And so as we close this Advent season, we must also encourage, be encouraged that he will return again. That's how much he loves us. We can have hope, peace, joy, and we can love others because we can dwell on the promise that he is coming soon. The one who is love gives us the gift of love. The gift came with a sacrifice. The sacrifice was the cross. The sacrifice was the Father sending His Son. This gift is how we are saved. We are saved from, from the, the sins of the world. We are saved from death. Oh, death, where is your sting? 
this gift we must share with others. And so as we close, I encourage us all to respond to today's message. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for sending your son. As we celebrate this Christmas and as we remember you coming into the world as a baby, I pray that we would be reminded that you didn't just stay a baby, but you lived a sinless life because you love us. Father, I pray that if there's any individual in the room who does not have a relationship with you, who has never experienced the love of Christ, I pray that they would just be bold. I pray that they would respond to not my message, but your message, your message of the cross, Father. Thank you so much for each individual present in the room, Father. I pray that you would just teach them how to love. Give them courage to go and tell others about this this good gift, this great gift. Pray that you would just encourage us all as we leave this building, Father, to go and spread the gospel. Thank you so much for loving us again. In Jesus' name, amen.